Chapter 5 of The Path of Prosperity This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Sunny Abdullah Chapter 5 The Secret of Health, Success, and Power We all remember with what intense delight, as children, we listened to the never-tiring fairy tale. How eagerly we followed the fluctuating fortunes of the good boy or girl, ever protected in the hour of crisis, from the evil machinations of the scheming witch, the cruel giant, or the wicked king. And our little hearts never faltered for the fate of the hero or heroine, nor do we doubt their ultimate triumph over all their enemies, for we knew that the fairies were infallible, and that they would never desert those who had consecrated themselves to the good and the true. And what unspeakable joy pulsated within us when the fairy queen, bringing all her magic to bear at the critical moment, scattered all the darkness and trouble, and granted them the complete satisfaction of all their hopes, and they were, happily ever after. With the accumulating years and an ever-increasing intimacy with the so-called realities of life, our beautiful fairy world became obliterated, and its wonderful inhabitants were relegated, in the archives of memory, to the shadowy and unreal and we thought we were wise and strong in thus leaving forever the land of childish dreams. But as we re-become little children in the wondrous world of wisdom, we shall return again to the inspiring dreams of childhood, and find that they are, after all, realities. The fairy folk, so small and nearly always invisible, yet possessed of an all-conquering and magical power, who bestow upon the good, health, wealth, and happiness, along with all the gifts of nature in lavish profusion, start again into reality and become immortalized in the soul realm of him who, by growth in wisdom, has entered into a knowledge of the power of thought and the laws which govern the inner world of being. To him the fairies live again as thought people, thought messengers, thought powers working in harmony with the overruling good. And they who, day by day, endeavour to harmonise their hearts with the heart of the supreme good, do in reality acquire true health, wealth and happiness. There is no protection to compare with goodness, and by goodness I do not mean a mere outward conformity to the rules of morality. I mean pure thought, noble aspiration, unselfish love, and freedom from vainglory. To dwell continually in good thoughts, is to throw around oneself a psychic atmosphere of sweetness and power which leaves its impress upon all who come in contact with it. As the rising sun puts to rout the helpless shadows, so are all the impotent forces of evil put to flight by the searching rays of positive thought which shine forth from a heart made strong in purity and faith. Where there is sterling faith and uncompromising purity, there is health, there is success, there is power. In such a one, disease, failure, and disaster can find no lodgment, for there is nothing on which they can feed. Even physical conditions are largely determined by mental states, and to this truth the scientific world is rapidly being drawn. The old, materialistic belief that a man is what his body makes him is rapidly passing away, and is being replaced by the inspiring belief that a man is superior to his body, and that his body is what he makes it by the power of thought. Men everywhere are ceasing to believe that a man is despairing because he is dyspeptic, and are coming to understand that he is dyspeptic because he is despairing, and in the near future, the fact that all disease has its origin in the mind will become common knowledge. There is no evil in the universe but has its root and origin in the mind, and sin, sickness, Sorrow and affliction do not, in reality, belong to the universal order, are not inherent in the nature of things, but are the direct outcome of our ignorance of the right relations of things. According to tradition, there once lived, in India, a school of philosophers who led a life of such absolute purity and simplicity that they commonly reached the age of a 150 years, and to fall sick was looked upon by them as an unpardonable disgrace for it was considered to indicate a violation of law. The sooner we realize and acknowledge that sickness, 
far from being the arbitrary visitation of an offended God, or the test of an unwise providence, is the result of our own error or sin, the sooner we shall enter upon the highway of health. Disease comes to those who attract it, to those whose minds and bodies are receptive to it, and flees from those whose strong, pure, and positive thought sphere generates healing and life-giving currents. If you are given to anger, worry, jealousy, greed, or any other inharmonious state of mind, and expect perfect physical health, you are expecting the impossible, for you are continually sowing the seeds of disease in your mind. Such conditions of mind are carefully shunned by the wise man, for he knows them to be far more dangerous than a bad drain or an infected house. If you would be free from all physical aches and pains, and would enjoy perfect physical harmony, then put your mind in order, and harmonize your thoughts. Think joyful thoughts, think loving thoughts. Let the elixir of goodwill course through your veins, and you will need no other medicine. Put away your jealousies, your suspicions, your worries, your hatreds, your selfish indulgences, and you will put away your dyspepsia, your biliousness, your nervousness and aching joints. If you will persist in clinging to these dehabilitating and demoralizing habits of mind, then do not complain when your body is laid low with sickness. The following story illustrates the close relation that exists between habits of mind and bodily conditions. A certain man was afflicted with a painful disease, and he tried one physician after another, but all to no purpose. He then visited towns which were famous for their curative waters, and after having bathed in them all, his disease was more painful than ever. One night he dreamed that a presence came to him, and said, Brother, hast thou tried all means of cure? And he replied, I have tried all. Nay, said the presence, come with me, and I will show thee a healing bath which has escaped thy notice. The afflicted man followed, and the presence led him to a clear pool of water, and said, Plunge thyself in this water, and thou shalt surely recover, and thereupon vanished. The man plunged into the water, and on coming out, lo, his disease had left him, and at the same moment he saw written above the pool the word, Renounce. Upon waking, the full meaning of his dream flashed across his mind, and looking within he discovered that he had, all along, been a victim to a sinful indulgence, and he vowed that he would renounce it forever. He carried out his vow, and from that day his affliction began to leave him, and in a short time he was completely restored to health. Many people complain that they have broken down through overwork. In the majority of such cases, the breakdown is more frequently the result of foolishly wasted energy. If you would secure health, you must learn to work without friction. To become anxious or excited, or to worry over needless details, is to invite a breakdown. Work, whether of brain or body, is beneficial and health-giving, and the man who can work with a steady and calm persistency, freed from all anxiety and worry, and with his mind utterly oblivious to all but the work he has in hand, will not only accomplish far more than the man who is always hurried and anxious, but he will retain his health, a boon which the other quickly forfeits. True health and true success go together, for they are inseparably intertwined in the thought realm. As mental harmony produces bodily health, so it also leads to a harmonious sequence in the actual working out of one's plans. Order your thoughts and you will order your life. Pour the oil of tranquility upon the turbulent waters of the passions and prejudices, and the tempests of misfortune, howsoever they may threaten, will be powerless to wreck the bark of your soul as it threads its way across the ocean of life. And if that bark be piloted by a cheerful and never-failing faith, its course will be doubly sure, and many perils will pass it by which would otherwise attack it. By the power of faith, every enduring work is accomplished. Faith in the Supreme, faith in the overruling law, faith in your work, and in your power to accomplish that work. Here is the rock upon which you must build if you would achieve, if you would stand and not fall. To follow, under all circumstances, 
the highest promptings within you, to be always true to the divine self, to rely upon the inward light, the inward voice, and to pursue your purpose with a fearless and restful heart, believing that the future will yield unto you the meat of every thought and effort, knowing that the laws of the universe can never fail, and that your own will come back to you with mathematical exactitude. This is faith, and the living of faith. By the power of such a faith, the dark waters of uncertainty are divided, every mountain of difficulty crumbles away, and the believing soul passes on unharmed. Strive, O reader, to acquire, above everything, the priceless possession of this dauntless faith, for it is the talisman of happiness, of success, of peace, of power, of all that makes life great and superior to suffering. Build upon such a faith, and you build upon the rock of the eternal, and with the materials of the eternal, and the structure that you erect will never be dissolved, for it will transcend all the accumulations of material luxuries and riches, the end of which is dust. Whether you are hurled into the depths of sorrow, or lifted upon the heights of joy, ever retain your hold upon this faith, ever return to it as your rock of refuge, and keep your feet firmly planted upon its immortal and immovable base. Centered in such a faith, you will become possessed of such a spiritual strength as will shatter, like so many toys of glass, all the forces of evil that are hurled against you, and you will achieve a success such as the mere striver after worldly gain can never know or even dream of. If ye have faith, and doubt not, ye shall not only do this, but if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. There are those today, men and women, tabernacled in flesh and blood, who have realized this faith, who live in it and by it day by day, and who, having put it to the utmost test, have entered into the possession of its glory and peace. Such have sent out the word of command, and the mountains of sorrow and disappointment, of mental weariness and physical pain have passed from them, and have been cast into the sea of oblivion. If you will become possessed of this faith, you will not need to trouble about your success or failure, and success will come. You will not need to become anxious about results, but will work joyfully and peacefully, knowing that right thoughts and right efforts will inevitably bring about right results. I know a lady who has entered into many blissful satisfactions, and recently a friend remarked to her, Oh, how fortunate you are. You only have to wish for a thing, and it comes to you. And it did, indeed, appear so on the surface. But in reality, all the blessedness that has entered into this woman's life is the direct outcome of the inward state of blessedness which she has, throughout life, been cultivating and training toward perfection. Mere wishing brings nothing but disappointment. It is living that tells. The foolish wish and grumble, the wise work and wait, and this woman had worked, worked without and within, but especially within upon heart and soul, and with the invisible hands of the spirit she had built up, with the precious stones of faith, hope, joy, devotion and love, a fair temple of light, whose glorifying radiance was ever round about her. It beamed in her eye, it shone through her countenance, it vibrated in her voice, and all who came into her presence felt its captivating spell. And as with her, so with you. Your success, your failure, your influence, your whole life you carry about you, for your dominant trends of thought are the determining factors in your destiny. Send forth loving, stainless, and happy thoughts, and blessings will fall into your hands, and your table will be spread with the cloth of peace. Send forth hateful, impure, and unhappy thoughts, and curses will rain down upon you, and fear and unrest will wait upon your pillow. You are the unconditional maker of your fate, be that fate what it may. Every moment you are sending forth from you the influences which make or mar your life. Let your heart grow large, and loving, and unselfish, and great and lasting will be your influence and success, even though you make little money. 
confine it within the narrow limits of self-interest, and even though you become a millionaire, your influence and success at the final reckoning will be found to be utterly insignificant. Cultivate, then, this pure and unselfish spirit, and combine with purity and faith, synchronous of purpose, and you are evolving from within the elements, not only of abounding health and enduring success, but of greatness and power. If your present position is distasteful to you, and your heart is not in your work, nevertheless perform your duties with scrupulous diligence. And whilst resting your mind in the idea that the better position and greater opportunities are waiting for you, ever keep an active mental outlook for budding possibilities, so that when the critical moment arrives, and the new channel presents itself, you will step into it with your mind fully prepared for the undertaking, and with that intelligence and foresight which is born of mental discipline. Whatever your task may be, concentrate your whole mind upon it. Throw into it all the energy of which you are capable. The faultless completion of small tasks leads inevitably to larger tasks. See to it that you rise by steadily climbing, and you will never fall. And herein lies the secret of true power. Learn, by constant practice, how to husband your resources, and to concentrate them, at any moment, upon a given point. The foolish waste all their mental and spiritual energy in frivolity, foolish chatter, or selfish argument, not to mention wasteful physical excesses. If you would acquire overcoming power, you must cultivate poise and passivity. You must be able to stand alone. All power is associated with immovability. The mountain, the massive rock, the storm-tried oak, all speak to us of power, because of their combined solitary grandeur and defiant fixity, while the shifting sand, the yielding wig, and the waving reed speak to us of weakness, because they are movable and non-resistant and are utterly useless when detached from their fellows. He is the man of power who, when all of his fellows are swayed by some emotion or passion, remains calm and unmoved. He only is fitted to command and control who has succeeded in commanding and controlling himself. The hysterical, the fearful, the thoughtless and frivolous, let such seek company, or they will fall for lack of support. But the calm the fearless, the thoughtful, and let such seek the solitude of the forest, the desert, and the mountain top, and to their power more power will be added, and they will more and more successfully stem the psychic currents and whirlpools which engulf mankind. Passion is not power, it is the abuse of power, the dispersion of power. Passion is like a furious storm which beats fiercely and wildly upon the embattled rock, whilst power is like the rock itself, which remains silent and unmoved through it all. That was a manifestation of true power when Martin Luther, wearied with the persuasions of his fearful friends, who were doubtful as to his safety should he go to Worms, replied, If there were as many devils in Worms as there are tiles on the housetops, I would go. And when Benjamin Disraeli broke down in his first parliamentary speech, and brought upon himself the derision of the house. That was an exhibition of germinal power when he exclaimed, The day will come when you will consider it an honour to listen to me. When that young man, whom I knew, passing through continual reverses and misfortunes, was mocked by his friends and told to desist from further effort, and he replied, The time is not far distant when you will marvel at my good fortune and success. He showed that he was possessed of that silent and irresistible power which is taking him over innumerable difficulties, and crowned his life with success. If you have not this power, you may acquire it by practice, and the beginning of power is likewise the beginning of wisdom. You must commence by overcoming those purposeless trivialities to which you have hitherto been a willing victim. Boisterous and uncontrolled laughter, slander and idle talk, and joking merely to raise a laugh, all these must be put on one side as so much waste of valuable energy. St. Paul never showed his wonderful insight into the hidden laws of human progress to greater advantage than when he warned the Ephesians against foolish talking and jesting which is not convenient. 
for to dwell habitually in such practices is to destroy all spiritual power and life. As you succeed in rendering yourself impervious to such mental dissipations, you will begin to understand what true power is, and you will then commence to grapple with the more powerful desires and appetites which hold your soul in bondage, and bar the way to power, and your further progress will then be made clear. Above all, be of single aim. Have a legitimate and useful purpose, and devote yourself unreservedly to it. Let nothing draw you aside. Remember that the double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Be eager to learn, but slow to beg. Have a thorough understanding of your work, and let it be your own. And as you proceed, ever following the inward guide, the infallible voice, you will pass on from victory to victory, and will rise step by step to higher resting places, and your ever-broadening outlook will gradually reveal to you the essential beauty and purpose of life. Self-purified, health will be yours. Faith protected, success will be yours. Self-governed, power will be yours. And all that you do will prosper. For, ceasing to be a disjointed unit, self-enslaved, you will be in harmony with the great law, working no longer against, but with, the universal life, the eternal good. And what health you gain, it will remain with you, What success you achieve will be beyond all human computation and will never pass away. And what influence and power you wield will continue to increase throughout the ages, for it will be a part of that unchangeable principle which supports the universe. This, then, is the secret of health, a pure heart and a well-ordered mind. This is the secret of success, an unfaltering faith and a wisely directed purpose and to rein in, with unfaltering will, the dark steed of desire. This is the secret of power. All ways are waiting my feet to tread, the light and dark, the living and the dead, the broad and narrow way, the high and low, the good and bad, and with quick step or slow. I now may enter any way I will, and find, by walking, which is good, which ill. And all good things my wandering feet await, if I but come with vow and violate. Unto the narrow, high and holy way of heart-born purity, and therein stay. Walking, secure from him who taunts and scorns, to flowery meads across the path of thorns. And I may stand where health, success, and power Await my coming, if, each fleeting hour, I cling to love and patience, and abide with stainlessness, and never step aside from high integrity, so shall I see at last the land of immortality, and I may seek and find, I may achieve, I may not claim, but, losing, may retrieve. The law bends not for me, but I must bend unto the law, if I would reach the end of my afflictions, if I would restore my soul to light and life, and weep no more. Not mine the arrogant and selfish claim, to all good things, be mine the lowly aim, to seek and find, to know and comprehend, and wisdom ward all holy footsteps wend. Nothing is mine to claim or to command, to 